Empire to, to create this buffer zone where they could ruthlessly uh, bomb and, and use these people uh, for their own advantage. Uh, something that they didn't realize uh, is that no matter what you do, you can't break the bonds of the people. Um, and so we have a very interesting personality um, of this region that is very distinct from the rest of Pakistan, um, and that is that they, um, they are all ethnically Pashtun, um, and that is uh, an ethnicity that straddles both Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, and something that a lot of people have talked about uh, is the code of conduct that governs this region. Um, and that's something that's really important to understand. Um, Medea Benjamin, um, who I work with at Code Pink, uh, wrote about this a little, and I was glad that people were finally bringing it up. And it's called Pashtun Wali, um, and it's an ancient code um, of conduct that, that binds these people together. And the most important uh, standards of this code of conduct are hospitality um, and revenge, which is known as Badal. Um, and what Badal does is that you, your, um, your responsibility is to your people. So when your area is under attack, you are governed by this code of conduct to defend them the best of your ability. And in my opinion, this is a very, very beautiful, um, it, it's a beautiful code, and, that has, and, and that's why um, this area is known to be extremely hospitable and to be very generous. Um, and unfortunately, this code has been exploited um, by the many visitors that come to this land, such as the Taliban and um, the Mujahideen and, um, and other extremists that have unfortunately taken over the region. Um, and then we have hospitality, and basically, you have to open your door to and host people of all the tribes in the region. Um, if they are Pashtun, and there are many different different tribes, but if you are Pashtun, you have to open your door to and host these people. Um, and 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 this is how it's always been. Unfortunately, it has been exploited um, and used uh, by by factions such as the Taliban um, that use it to their advantage to live in these homes um, and use them as bases. So I wanted to start off by giving you a sense of, of the land, because often we think that um, the capital city of Pakistan, Islamabad, is very similar to the places we're bombing. It's not. We, we sit in our homes, we watch it on television, um, we, we say that it's a violation of our sovereignty, um, but we don't understand that where this is taking place um, is an area that's been so historically marginalized that we can separate ourselves from it. So while we're trying to shift the American perspective on it, we also need to do some work at home. Um, so it's important to have allies on both sides um, of the ocean. Um, and also, one of the reasons I'm starting off is because I wanted to read some uh, some victims' narratives from um, from Medea's book that I found the most powerful ones that that I think speak uh, to the terrorism uh, perpetrated by drones. And um, after that, I'd like to have a moment of silence. Um, I think that's always key to any event surrounding drones. Um, part of the terror of drones is that um, the victims do not have uh, any acknowledgement. Um, and that is kind of the duality of, of a secret war. Um, and people often ask me what the difference is between uh, fighter jets uh, <laughs> raining terror on lands when it's a war that's recognized and what the difference is between drones doing the same thing. And what I always tell them is nobody understands drones. Um, and, and, and they are a mysterious, mythical creature. And part of them being, um, being, I guess, the birds of terror, as some people have called them recently, um, is that everything is secret. These, these lives are not acknowledged, they're not counted for. Um, and the difficulty in, in, in humanizing this war is that these narratives are hidden. So we have important projects like the Naming the Dead project that the Bureau of Investigative Journalism um, is doing, where they're trying uh, to track uh, every single name and every single person. It's certainly very difficult with estimates of at least 3,500 to 4,000 civilian casualties, but they're doing it. They're piecing it bit by bit. We also have something called the drone quilt um, that Leah Bolger is, is taking over it, where people are sending quilts with, um, with a victim's narrative on it in any way you want. It could be somebody's face, it could be somebody's age, but these are important ways to bring these stories to the forefront. Um, so we need to keep trying to do that. Um, and an important way to do that is to mourn these lives because they often have not had the, the privilege of even being acknowledged 
um, by, by, the, by their Pakistani government. So the, the most we can do is, um, is do that here. Um, so I'm going to read some of, some of the, the pieces that speak most um, to me. The, the primary drone documenters in, um, in Pakistan, his name is also Noor, um, but it's Noor Bayram. He's a Pakistani photographer. And um, this really spoke to me. He said, there are just pieces of flesh uh, lying around after a strike. You can't find bodies, so the locals pick up the flesh and curse America. They say that America is killing us inside our own country, inside our own homes, and only because we are Muslims. Um, is is from, from Palestine, and it says, according to Hamdi Shakura's group, um, Israeli drones killed at least 825 people between 2006 and 2011, the majority civilians. According to one study, the majority of children living in Gaza suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder as a result of the constant buzzing and bombing of Israeli death machines. It's continuous watching us, especially at night, said Nabil, a Gaza mechanic and father of eight. You can't sleep, you can't watch television, it frightens the kids. When they hear it, they say, it is going to hit us. And another important narrative um, is that of the pilots. Sometimes we, we say that they're so uninvolved um, that they are sitting here and they treat it like a game. But something that we need to understand about games um, is that you are involved in what you are doing. You are fixated um, on the lives of these people that you are following um, and putting into what they call a disposition matrix, which is basically um, summing up the personality traits and trends of these suspected targets. So if it looks as though you're traveling in a group of four people who look exactly the same, they're going to say you're a target. Um, so, so what we need to understand is that these pilots are intimately involved in what they do, um, and, and that's what disgusts me the most, is that they are both intimately involved but can separate themselves at the same time. Um, so here is, um, is one person who actually came out and talked about the horror and anguish um, inflicted upon him um, as, as, as a result of being a drone pilot. Um, he wrote a book called The Predator, um, and his name is Matt Morton. And he said, in one case, he described how he, had, how he had carefully planned to blow up a group of supposed rebels who were standing around a truck. Suddenly, two kids on a bicycle appeared on the screen. There was an older boy, about 10, and a younger boy bounced on the handlebars. They were laughing and riding alongside the truck. Panicking, Martin, the author, wanted to stop the missile, but it was too late. The sensor operator had already released it. Mesmerized by approaching calamity, we could only stare in abject horror at the, as a silent missile bore down upon them out of the sky. When the screens cleared, I saw the bicycle blown 20 feet away. One of the tires was still spinning. The bodies of the two little boys lay bent and broken amongst the bodies of the insurgents. One last one um, that I think is important, and this is a figure um, that people talk about a lot when they talk about drones, is Tariq Aziz. Um, he was a 16-year-old boy, and prior to being killed, he uh, was part of a jirga, which is a, a community um, gathering. Um, and he took place in the first community jirga um, in the capital city of Islamabad, um, ever on drone strikes. Um, Shahzad Akbar, who is a lawyer for the, cons uh, for the Center for Constitutional Rights in Islamabad, um, was approached by a journalist from the tribal territories, whose name is Karim, um, whose brother and son had been killed in drone strikes. Um, he found out about Shahzad Akbar and approached him to sue um, the perpetrators of drone strikes. Um, so what Shahzad Akbar, this lawyer, had been doing was training people on the ground to document these casualties because often they go unnoticed and unrecognized in the rubble and the devastation. Um, so he had been training Tariq Aziz how to use a camera um, to capture uh, the civilian casualties in Waziristan. And he had been at this community jirga, which was well attended, well covered um, by, by the BBC. Representatives from Reprieve UK were there. Imran Khan, um, who is a very popular political figure, who's already president in Pakistan, was there. Um, tons and tons of people. 
and when he returned home, a missile, a missile killed him. Um, so, so that's um, what I wanted to end with was that we can't brush these off as coincidences um, when we talk about how these casualties take place. Tariq Aziz was definitely on, the, on somebody's radar um, as somebody who was documenting these casualties. And people often forget what his role was, and his role was vital to covering um, and, and, and filling the gaps in, in the drone war. Um, and he was killed. So, so I'm, I'm not one for conspiracy theories, but I can't brush this aside um, as a mistake. Um, so if we could just focus um, for about a minute on, on these lives that have been lost um, and contemplate, and maybe we can discuss this after it's over, um, how we can stitch these narratives back together um, and honor these lives um, as they're being lost. Because um, if we give them the attention that they deserve, um, and, and bring them to the forefront to, to try and stitch their stories together. Who's, whose children are they? Whose mom is it? Whose dad is it? Um, where did they live? What did they do? Um, we, we can begin to, to give them the recognition that they deserve. See, so we could just have a moment of silence. First of all, I will start with a simple introduction about myself. My name is Sara, and um, I'm from Iraq. Uh, I lived all my life in Iraq. I left recently, um, 2010. Actually, I came here. I came. I went to Syria, and I stayed for one year. Then Jordan. Then I went. I came here to study at the University of Rochester for a year, but I had to cut my studies and go back home. Um, for personal like issues, uh, I back home I finished my degree, which is uh, I have a bachelor in dentistry, in dental science, and oral surgery. Uh, I'm not practicing right now because I have like some things to deal with, like this. Uh, I came to the U.S. in March for um, the Young Conference, uh, uh, the Young Commission on the Status of Women. Uh, for I present, I, I wanted to present, but I couldn't. I I, I came too late, uh, and it is all, it's about violence against women rights. Um, and then I, I I also came for this. I had it also planned that, to come here uh, to present in this conference, which I'm really thankful for. Well, I didn't write a speech to, like just words and uh, saying them because most of the time when I do that. I have notes, and I look at them, and I never stick to the to these cards. I, I digress so much because I have so much to say, and when I see this, like oh, I get tempted, and I don't stick to it. So I thought of a way that I should like just stick to a script because I know this. Like I want some things to be said, and I don't want to be lost between my words. So I thought, and I thought, and I thought that I should write a poem. I write poetry. And I thought the only thing that can like put me in a line is poetry. So I, ha I had to write a poem. That's what I did. So I will share with you my poem. I call my poem is my speech, my poem, my life. Today, I should celebrate. I should jump of happiness for the war's end. Yet I'm not. Ten years of occupation in Iraq and the war isn't over. I was five when I knew what war means or meant. Or did I? Let's see. I thought it's playing with dolls like it would be my last day. Hearing sound that are so loud. 
just to staying home. My funny uncle making funny noises. Shadow games on the wall. No electricity and no water. I thought it's sanctioned. I had a hero though. I had someone that will save me. I had Superman. <laughs> 20 years later, and just barely knowing what war means. Let's see again and take a look. Backing so fast. Grandfather, God bless his soul, taking us to the village where war cannot reach. Father, mother staying behind, and the fear of losing them is the only image that plays in my mind for weeks. War begins. Regime falls, Americans saved us. No electricity, no water. Years passes. 2003, 2004, 2005. Father got a threat because he's a professor in the college. Mil malicious ruling, controlling, government changes. Democracy now. Family leaves. Leaves everything behind, including me. Year after year, walking out of the house, thinking, and talking to the door. I, will, I hope I will see you soon. Bodies on the street, no one can touch them. No one can move. The side of death is everywhere. And the smell of hell is evident on earth. On top of all, I know now that heroes aren't real. I had no Superman. I had to finish my studies though. 2005, 2006, 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010. Done, I finished. Time to go home. But where is home? Iraqis are like that after the war. Homeless people in a continuous search to belong. It's the case for me. My country in heart will give my life to serve and save. But where is home? I say it's where the heart is. But what if my heart is far away where I cannot reach? I will need to search again. Nowadays, the war is over, over. 60 to 70 life expectancy rate. 33.3% <coughs> infant mortality rate. Two million and more Iraqi refugees scattered between countries that don't even want them. 65% of Iraqi living in neglect, in poverty. With one hundred twenty billion dollar budget for the government. Who takes that? Who knows? Government? An entire country ruled by few? What change? Is that democracy? Being killed for you want to have voice? For being less religious? For being Christian? For being gay? For being different kind of Muslim? For being free? Oh, I definitely have different dictionary. A country ruled by the biggest embassy in the world. I wonder what that is. I'm sorry if I'm being explicit. I will try, I promise. I will try to be more diplomatic now. I will say, we are doing better. Growing economically. Democracy is developing. No, I cannot, I cannot do it. Health crisis. 
Baluja, Hawija, Najaf, and so many more. No one knows, but I will tell you now. Keep it a secret though, because this is how it should go. Important thing, never to be let out. We should bury them alive, yes. The idea I will talk about, it's war. War is the reason. Depleted uranium has been used. As well as white phosphorus, now I'm confused. All the population were affected, old and young, and kids now too? Being poisoned, even in their mom's womb. Congenital malformation, sterility, infertility, abnormal cancer types, and infant stability too. No worries though, the word is women decided not to get babies no more. United States says nothing about that. Iraqi elected government will hush anyone who breathes about the subject. And, and that was just an Iraqi thought and a, a side note. Explosion, no stability, no, mortal, no morality. People being abducted from their life, from their families, young and healthy, found dead in morals, better yet, on the streets. April 20, election. April 20, explosion that killed 32 persons. April 20, a protest that started in a small part of the northern part of Iraq. A small village that my father comes from, Hawija it's called, where the people are so simple and so nice. They live on farming and raising animals, peacefully protesting to get some sense into their life, to tell the government, listen to us asking for simple necessities in life, water, electricity, and on the serious side, for the innocent president to let out. They got killed, not only killed, bombed by the military, 50 persons dead, 150 wounded, badly wounded, but cannot be treated because they should die. They are terrorists, they want to change. And of course, U.S. are worried about Iraq. They care too much. I'm so touched. I have been told to keep still, not to move, not to speak, not to speak a word, for I might be killed. Or I might get something that I don't like. I will say I said nothing. I was reading a poem that I, I know nada about. Was walking, talking, found it on the ground. Stopping war is in our hands. By letting people know what it does and its implications are, war is easy. Militarization, a black a plan, attack, boom. We're done. What comes after the war should be gone. Hand in hand, we'll spread the word. Tell your friends and pick your sword. Use it, to cu use it as a knife to cut a cake. Never to use it as a weapon to slay dragon's head, for they are nice creatures after all. And please shout now with me. No to war, no to war. Not to war, not to war, not to war, not to war. Thank you. Up with that, that was incredible. Hi. Can you hear me now? I'm going to make a suggestion that we plug this into here.
Meanwhile, I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Ruj Al Wazir. Um, I'm originally from Yemen, grew up in DC, and had the privilege to go back home uh, and uh, visit my sister, who has been living there for um, four years now and very active, um, particularly on this issue. Um, so when I went back, um, I had just, uh, I arrived right when um, a drone explosion happened. So I, um, I guess, was faced with that reality and got to know more about the drone war through that. Um, so here's a little presentation that I did for a school, um, but I cut it down just so I can uh, you know, bring it on to here. So next. What that sound would mean to you. But for many Yemenis, this sound has become a reminder of fear, death, and destruction. What are drones? Drones come in many, many different sizes. Um, you see Hillary Clinton over here playing with one as if it's a, a toy. Um, however, this is the, uh, the drone that has become very familiar to Yemenis, um, Predator drone. The first US drone strike uh, was in November 2002, and the US drone war is in partnership with the Yemeni government. Uh, the Yemeni government um, has come out and said, yes, we accept the, the drone strikes. They're killing um, uh, the terrorists. We're totally OK with it. Um, under Obama administration, um, there has been a significant amount of uh, drone uh, increase in terms of raw numbers and in uh, strikes and in geographic areas. So you can see it with this. Um, diagram over here. From 2002 there was one and then 2012-56 and just this year there's been at least four accounted for. Question, what, what are the two different uh, colors? There? So um, the, the darker blue uh, is what the U.S. government has um, acknowledged um, and uh, the lighter blue is what's been reported by human rights organizations. What are the years? So 2002, 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012. So we can see basically under Bush, it was one. As soon as Obama uh, came, uh, became president, a huge increase. Much everywhere. It's not like it's um, targeted in one area like Pakistan. It's all over Yemen. Um, in red, you will see where drones have striked. In orange, you will see where um, the drones have um, have just been flying over for sur surveillance, uh, including the capital, Sana'a. This is a quote that really resonated with me um, uh, by a uh, Yemeni journalist um, when we were talking about drones. It doesn't matter whether the innocent dies from a UAV, a Tomahawk, or a fighter jet. People have been obsessing over the wrong thing, UAVs rather than the real issue, killing innocents. Killings. These are the headlines of mainstream media. The New York Times, Yemen says strikes against Qaeda bases kills 34. Obama ordered US military strike on Yemen terrorists. CNN, 34 killed in Yemen terror raids. The Washington Post, Yemeni forces launch pre-dawn assault on alleged Al Qaeda sites. Of course, our mainstream media tells us that these are all militants that deserve to die. In reality, 40 people were killed this day in Majala village by a missile including 14 women and 21 children amongst them. This girl, the nine-year-old girl, named Afrah. The, the US would not acknowledge that it killed anybody, including her. Again, as soon as I arrived, there was a strike. Yemen airstrike kills 10 Qaeda members. U.S. drone kills five suspected militants in Yemen. <coughs> Once again, they claim that militants were killed when in reality, 12 civilians were killed, including three women. And of course, this is not the first case of civilian casualties, nor will it be the last. My brother was wounded from a sharpened in his chest, liver, and neck, in addition to burns of up to 50% of his body. On May 15, 2012, at least a dozen civilians died in a double airstrike in Ja'ar. Hassan's brother was injured in the second explosion. 
Now in Yemen, a lot of these drone strikes don't happen, they're, they're not just one strike. They're usually double strikes just to make sure that the civilian was actually caught. Um, so usually when the first strike hits, people run to make sure uh, to help the person that's just been hit. And when they go help that person, many more end up dying from the second strike. 13-year-old Ali Khadar was injured due to an airstrike and his jaw open. His father explains to me the trauma his son is suffering. He refuses to see his classmates because he is disfigured. One time, I hospitalized him because he overdosed on drugs. I believe he wanted to end his life, and it pains me to see that. Of course, private homes have been destroyed as well, like here in Qud village. I visited this place before and thought that their lives could not be worse. Seeing this destruction last July, I realized I was wrong. These are some footage, um, these are some photographs that um, on our trip my sister was able to take. People are afraid to go to weddings because whenever large groups of men gather, they are afraid a drone will hit them. As a result of these killings and destructions, airstrikes have come to terrorize an entire population, making them live in constant fear. The number, number of miscarriages has increased. People reduce their social gatherings, such as weddings and funerals, and parents are now afraid to send their children to school. Because if they're three, and they're 16 year, years or older, they're a militant. While the Yemeni government is a partner in the war on terror, people still see the US strikes as a breach of sovereignty. There's also a perceived violation of honor, as some tribesmen have expressed concern that the drones are able to see inside their houses and spy on their women. Backlash. What are some of the uh, backlash that we may see to the US? Drones are a declaration of war without declaring it as such. When you are surprised and hit from afar, and if you are an innocent target on the ground, it is going to cause some major repercussions. This is a um, ad or a um, graphic uh, made by some Yemeni um, activists that says no to killing innocent civilians and holding both the US and the Yemeni government accountable. I will even join Satan if I have to in order to get revenge for my wounded son says an angered father from Jahar. I will show you a little video that... Um My State of Department. <laughs> so, uh... <laughs> well, yeah, so, um, um... I want to convey a message of a Madhubi girl who lost her entire family by a drone strike. She said, America is nothing for me other than a drone and a bomb. I mean, it's, it's sad. I know, you know, I know the Americans are not that evil. <coughs> and, and I know another story of a 16-year-old uh, old boy, what's his name? The Awlaki son? Abdurrahman Awlaki. He's an American citizen. Yes. And he killed because his father recognized as a terrorist. So I don't know if it's that uh, the real the real image of the United States for us as Yemenis. So um, Obama was like we were we were supporting him, we loved Obama, but we didn't know that he he might he's worse than Bush in terms of the foreign policy. No, I want you to understand that what creates terrorism in the MENA region is the foreign policy of the United States. I know a lot of Americans, I came here like in the beginning, in the, in the middle of the march. Um, they are very nice, I love them all. When, when they asked where I'm from, I said I'm from Yemen. Oh, oh which state? I think it's stayed by its own. <laughs> so I'd like to thank you all and thank Rose for presenting the drone. Um, if you have any question, you can pass it along. So thank you very much. 
you available to speak Good in question. communities that are represented here? You know, yeah. maybe could you each tell us how we could be in touch with you in the future? Mm -hmm. Maybe we could start. My, my, the best way to contact me is my email. Um, I always, re I, I get emails and I reply, so my email is the best way. Do you want me to say it? Yeah, exactly. Okay, so my email is Sarah, S-A-R-A-H, underscore, A-K, at, 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 it's the end of, yeah, at, Y, from Yahoo, Y mail, M A I L dot com. Thank you. It's Rouj, R O O J, 129 at gmail dot com, and that's the best way to reach me. Um, yeah, I answer my emails really fast. Hi, um, I'm Noor, N O O R, at CodePink, C O D E Pink dot org. Um, and Rouge and I are going to be planning um, public education outreach in schools to try and get youth more involved, um, which we'll be doing together. Um, so yeah, you'll, you'll be seeing us around for that. Good. That's great. Where are you based, Mohammed? Thank you. Um, uh, Beth has just asked where Mohammed is based. Um, nowadays, you mean? Yes. Uh, in Crystal City, Washington. Um, yes, I am Fida, and I'm Palestinian, uh, <coughs> born and raised in Gaza for 23 years. I'm 24 right now. And, uh, and uh, I've lived my whole life under occupation and I experienced the war, and I survived. And uh, yeah, and uh, I also like speaking of the drones, I'm so uh, pleased to be here and to see like how people are against the drones because they are horrible. When you live um, with a consonant buzzing sounds overhead, sometimes the whole like, especially during the night, you cannot sleep, you cannot study, you cannot do anything because of the consonant buzzing. Sometimes it, uh, it will last for 24 seven a day, just buzzing. So, and, uh, and only actually, because since uh, the siege was imposed on Gaza in 2006, um, I actually, I forgot how my life looked looked like before the siege. All what I remember is um, I experienced war in 2008-2009 and, and, and when I came to the state I realized how we normalized the life of injustice and how I was dehumanized as a human being and how I was deprived of my basic human rights. Even the simple thing you cannot sleep because of drones. Sometimes we don't have running water in the, um, in the house. You don't have electricity. Sometimes it would last for days. I don't know why. Is it because we are Palestinians from Gaza? So, so when I came to the state and I met people, and I started talking about the narrative that is missing from the mainstream, People were really shocked, especially Americans. They don't know that such a narrative existed. So this actually, when I said, like during the war actually, when you don't know you're gonna be, like you would survive or not, my English was, I didn't know any English, so I said, I will, I will study English if I survive. So when I came, so if I had the chance, to speak, so I would speak in a language people would understand me, and we would, we, people would know what happened to us in 2008, uh, Operation Castle, which is the war. And, and now, while I'm standing here, I didn't plan, uh, I mean, I didn't know about this, I didn't know that I would speak 
So while I'm studying it, I just remember that I vowed like four years ago, and now I'm here, I'm speaking my mind experience as a person who, uh, who witnessed war and who survived. And thank you very much for your effort. Thank you like for, for standing for a, good, for a good cause and for saying no to drones, no to war, for, for asking for peace. So thank you very much. <laughs> suffering caused. And I know there are other questions. Marianne, you want to comment? I was going to ask if she could give us her uh, Fida, is there a way that we could stay in touch with you? Yeah. Um, actually, I have my own blog, and I, I start yeah. writing personal stories as a person who, Good. as a human being who lived in Gaza, because I know that many people do not know like how a Palestinian living in Gaza, what's the normal life. So I read that my, my personal experience because I think when you personalize your story, you can relate to people, people can relate to you. So my blog is just my name, fidaabuasi.com. Fida is F-I-D-A-A-A-B-U-A-S-S-I. Too many A's, so. <laughs> and dot com. So www.fidaabuasi.com. And my name is Fida Abuasi. And you can also reach, um, you can email me anytime, and I'm so quick uh, to reply to an email. Fida.abuasi at gmail.com. Uh, at gmail, yes. the name again. Okay, yes. my name is F. Okay, I'm sorry. I am being Americanized, so I speak with like you. So okay, F. I. D. A A, my first name Fida, my last name A B U A S S I Abu Asi. Abu Asi. That's so uh, slow. So this is actually this is my name. Yes, my first and my last. At Gmail. Yeah. Uh, at Gmail. Uh, Fida dot Abu Asi at Gmail dot com. Oh, okay. But if you just write Fida Abu Asi, you will see. Yeah, get the blast. Thank you. Do we, we have some time for questions? About, oh, we, we have five minutes for questions um, along with our thanks. Do we have any questions for our panelists? Thank you. Uh, this is a question for Mohammed. Um, I'm wondering, I, I watched the testimony online on Tuesday of uh, the Yemeni gentleman who testified about the bombing. And he also mentioned he was in the U.S. on a State Department program where he studied. Is this the same program? I was expecting that question. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Can you repeat the question because we couldn't hear it. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just asking if he's here on the State there, Department there. program. Oh, thank you. The State Department program that brought the Yemeni uh, gentleman who also studied in the U.S. who gave testimony to Congress earlier this week. And what it, you know, can you explain a little bit about that program and where you're studying and what it's like for you to be in that sort of probably duality? Uh, actually, the, uh, I'm the program called the Leader of Democracy. Um, it's about, it's like half, once and a, once, one and a half month uh, academic session about democracy and uh, leadership. And then we have um, internship in near, near uh, Washington, D.C. And being sponsored by a uh, state of department, that doesn't mean I, I, I agree with them. <laughs> so um, um, maybe they have like uh, they want they want us to uh, express our opinion in, in the United States about the issues that related to the foreign policy. Um, and actually, I think we have a meeting with the uh, Senator Kerry, um, which is we we think it's. Uh, it's a good thing to communicate and to uh, exchange our opinion in one way. That's, that definitely doesn't mean that we are biased or we agree with their policy or something. So, um, How many? I'm oh, sorry? How many of you are? Uh, 22 from MENA region. It's great that you're going to be with Karen. Uh, yeah. You have to write a blog about that. <laughs> yeah, sure. If it's on record, I mean. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we also want to thank each of you for your bravery in speaking out. I want you to know that Jeremy Scahill, who's a journalist that we're all enamored with, dedicated his last book to the journalists who live in the country and who stay, and to the activists who live in a country and stay. He said he's kind of like a parachute um, activist, but we know that you have ties to your land and um, relatives that you are thinking about every day. Um, I want to 
make a quick advertisement, if it's okay. Voices for Creative Nonviolence will start a walk from the Rock Island Arsenal, which is responsible for manufacturing many of the parts for US weaponry, including drones. And we'll walk to Des Moines, Iowa. In the Midwest, there is a replication of Hancock Field, and that's the Air National Guard base outside of Des Moines. So if you're thinking to yourself, I'd like to run away, run away <laughs> and come with us. Uh, it starts June 8th. I'll leave tomorrow to go to Afghanistan and come back just on time to start this walk. And um, it's a good, healthy way. And so if any of you could spare the time, we would love to be like a magnet and draw you to the Midwest uh, for a, a, a series of venues as we walk across the Midwest. So thank you for listening to that announcement. Be in touch with Voices if you'd like to walk with us June 8th to the 28th. And spend so much time in Afghanistan. I think last year there were over 480 drone strikes in Afghanistan, something we never hear about. There were 48 in Pakistan. What's happening to yeah. Afghanistan by these drones is horrific, and we're finding out nothing about it. The U.S. government said only 16 people were killed in 485 drone strikes, which is totally impossible. Strikes. And um, a kind of a macabre task that those of us at Voices for Creative Nonviolence have set ourselves is to keep updating what we call the Afghanistan Atrocities Update. And we just give a quick narration of each time that civilians, unarmed civilians, are killed in Afghanistan. Now, it may be that the killing is done by a combat brigade unit helicopter, or it may be that the killing is done in a night raid. But you see, the drone surveillance is also key, and that's the kind of a mix that we're now seeing. And certainly in Gaza, it's been experimented with, with horrible results. And we know in Yemen and Somalia, in other parts of the world, what they're combining is the Joint Special Operations Forces, the drone surveillance, so-called cybersecurity, civilian military, and the security contractors. And again and again and again, we'll find that women and children who are just out doing what they normally do, collecting fuel, scavenging for scrap metal, clearing irrigation ditches, they're um, complete innocents sometimes just living in their own homes. And then the Hellfire missiles are fired, or the 500-pound bombs are dropped, or the night raid breaks into a home and people are killed. And oftentimes what you'll get is the first response from the International Security Assistance Forces is, we're investigating. And then if you, if you manage to stay on it, then you'll find out that, in fact, the United States acknowledges and says, we're sorry. This tragedy should never have happened. But the sorrows, the regrets are not trustworthy because it keeps happening again and again and again. I think President Hamid Karzai of Afghanistan almost has to rail against the United States in order to mollify and appease his own public. But when you hear that the war in Afghanistan is ending, make no mistake, it's simply not true. General John Allen finally said the fighting will continue into 2015. The Taliban have said they don't care how many troops the United States keeps in Afghanistan. If there are any troops there, they'll keep fighting. And so the war continues. And why? Dominance of the transport routes for precious and irreplaceable fossil fuels that can come from the Caspian Sea Basin, dominance for the roadways of the rare, of the extraction of rare earth minerals that are under the Hindu Kush mountains. And so the warfare will continue. Um, I think we've heard such moving testimony of the ways in which uh, people on the ground have suffered in Iraq, in Yemen, in Gaza, in Pakistan, and in Afghanistan that we, I believe, must continue to hear the truth because these wars will be marketed to U.S. people as humanitarian wars. How's that for an oxymoron? And we'll be continually told that the United States is trying to protect the women and children. So we must treasure and keep in our hearts the words that we've heard from people who can tell us the actual situation on the ground. Uh, thank you, Anne, for drawing attention to Afghanistan. And I see we have uh, Cynthia. Oh, okay. Cynthia, do you want to use the microphone? Oh, well, yeah. oh, 
Then we can hear you. That's awesome. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I, I just have a uh, little uh, card oh, and also well, a little uh, bar graph that tells how much the United States of America spends on military equipment and horrible weapons. 60%. So there isn't much left over for education, health, food, um, infrastructure, and everything. And so I just wanted to present, give one of these to each of these wonderful young people. I got four out of uh, five names with help from uh, Mary So this is for Guantanamo. Uh, Guantanamo. There are many and prisons, other prisons. Yeah, I'm just asking that we make sure that we um, include in our concerns the people in Guantanamo who are now on. Is it day 78 of a hunger strike? We know that, um, that there are people being forced fed, which is really a form of torture further. There are people hospitalized. And April 29th will be a day to remember worldwide Shah al Ahmed. The people in Britain have said, I mean, the government has said, send him back to us. And Britain's our ally. Why don't they free Shah al Ahmed? Uh, then there is a date in May, which is May 17th. May 17th as an international day, of the strike. day for a, a, a day of fasting in conjunction with the hunger strikes. And then, of course, we were also told that um, July 8th, I believe, is the day when the prisoners in California will launch their hunger strikes. In Palestine. And in Palestine, there are, there are prisoners in Israel's jails that have been on hunger strike for 200 days. Yeah, 200 days of hunger striking in Israeli jails. Uh, people whose lives have been so forgotten by many around the world. Any further announcement of dates, Marianne? Um, this is not a date. I had a question for Israel. And, and also the connection between Cornell University and Telephone. Israel, the Technion University. Marianne, I think you need to speak to that. I don't think we'd ask it enough. Actually, I have no idea. Oh, okay. But what I know, like the drones are U.S. made. Okay. Um, Israel is the largest exporter of drones in the world. And it is the second largest, um, I guess, nation that has the largest amounts of kinds of drones that they're creating. And so this issue is about the United States relationship to Israel is very fundamental to the whole drone issue that I think we should be addressing in a more open way. Um, and then locally in, at Cornell University, which has been licensed to operate drones itself, they ha have a partnership with Technion University in Israel. And Technion is the university that is most responsible for the research and development of military weapons in particular drones and unarmed bulldozers. And so these two, uh, I'm not unarmed, unmanned bulldozers. And so this uh, now in New York City has, is funding this collaboration to open a campus on Roosevelt Island. And so I would say that we've targeted the military bases in terms of where drones are coming from. But we haven't really looked at the role of universities in terms of the research and development, which I think we should be looking at more closely. And we should be more open about Israel's open, uh, role in the proliferation of drones. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Mr. Bruges, uh, we have an announcement about action surrounding Guantanamo next week. So next week uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, we're going to have a week of um, teach-ins, um, doing some uh, movie screenings, uh, a day of uh, poetry reading, letter uh, writing, to the, uh, in solidarity to the uh, Guantanamo hunger strikers. Um, uh, the human rights minister in Yemen is also um, planning a trip to go to Guantanamo uh, to demand that they return back to Yemen. So, um, so next week, if you're in D.C. or if you want to stop by for a day, we'll be there all week long in front of um, the State Department and um, 
perhaps maybe the uh, Yemeni embassy as well. Thank you. I mentioned about uh, the journalist. There's a journalist in Yemen. Uh, his name is Abdul Hay Shay. Uh, he is still in jail today under Obama's um, demand. He is one of the uh, first journalists to expose the U.S. Uh, drone war in Yemen. Uh, the president, uh, well, the ex-president, uh, uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh, um, had uh, excused him out of jail. As soon as President Obama found that out, demanded that he would turn back to jail. Uh, so he's still there uh, after uh, many, many years. And I, I just hope that you guys all can remember, um, remember him and keep him in, in your minds when you're thinking about this uh, drone war. Hi, um, I'm Marianne Grady Flores, and I just wanted to thank all of you, each of you, and Kathy. Um, I did want to make an announcement. Um, this May 1st, which is in, what is it, Wednesday, through the 5th of May, uh, will be the 10th anniversary of the United States Navy being beaten for the first time through nonviolent struggle at Don and Vieques, Puerto Rico. Uh, Vieques and the people of Vieques had struggled for 60 years to rid the Navy of the bombing of this little 21 mile um, island. The critical thing that I want to bring up and the connection with what's gone on in all of the other countries is the fact that all, every weapon system that we've ever used around the world was practiced with in Vieques. And the people in Vieques, when they were doing the nonviolent civil resistance there, said, we understand that our struggle is inextricably connected with what's going on with the rest of the world. So that courage and that promise that victory can happen is real. So we go, I'm going back myself.